these people are creating a terrible problem in our cities. They can't or won't hold a job, they flout the law constantly and neglect their children, they drink too much, and their moral standards would shame an alley cat. For some reason or other, they absolutely refuse to accommodate themselves to any kind of decent, civilized life. This was said in 1956, in Indianapolis, not about blacks or other minorities, but about poor whites from the South. Nor was Indianapolis unique in this respect. A 1951 survey in Detroit found that white Southerners living there were considered undesirable by 21% of those surveyed, compared to 13% who ranked blacks the same way. In the late 1940s, a Chicago employer said frankly, I told the guard at the plant gate to tell the hillbillies that there were no openings. When poor whites from the South moved into northern cities to work in war plants during the Second World War, occasionally a white southerner would find that a flat or a furnished room had just been rented when the landlord heard his southern accent. More is involved here than a mere parallel between blacks and southern whites. What is involved is a common subculture that goes back for centuries, which has encompassed everything from ways of talking to attitudes toward education, violence, and sex, and which originated not in the South, but in those parts of the British Isles from which white Southerners came. That culture long ago died out where it originated in Britain, while surviving in the American South. Then it largely died out among both white and black Southerners, while still surviving today in the poorest and worst of the urban black ghettos. It is not uncommon for a culture to survive longer where it is transplanted and to retain characteristics lost in its place of origin. The French spoken in Quebec and the Spanish spoken in Mexico contain words and phrases that have long since become archaic in France and Spain. Regional German dialects persisted among Germans living in the United States after those dialects had begun to die out in Germany itself. A scholar specializing in the history of the South has likewise noted among white Southerners archaic word forms, while another scholar has pointed out the continued use in that region of terms that were familiar at the time of the first Queen Elizabeth. The card game whist is today played almost exclusively by blacks, especially low-income blacks, though in the 18th century it was played by the British upper classes and has since then evolved into bridge. The history of the evolution of this game is indicative of a much broader pattern of cultural evolution in much more weighty things. Southern whites not only spoke the English language in very different ways from whites in other regions, their churches, their roads, their homes, their music, their education, their food, and their sex lives were all sharply different from those of other whites. The history of this redneck or cracker culture is more than a curiosity. It has contemporary significance because of its influence on the economic and social evolution of vast numbers of people, millions of blacks and whites, and its continuing influence on the lives and deaths of a residual population in America's black ghettos, which has still not completely escaped from that culture. From early in American history, foreign visitors and domestic travelers alike were struck by cultural contrasts between the white population of the South and that of the rest of the country in general, and of New England in particular. In the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, contrasted white Southerners with white Northerners in his classic Democracy in America, and Frederick Law Olmsted did the same later in his books about his travels through the antebellum South, notably Cotton Kingdom. De Tocqueville set a pattern when he concluded that almost all the differences which may be noticed between the Americans in the Southern and in the Northern states have originated in slavery. Olmsted likewise attributed the differences between white Southerners and white Northerners to the existence of slavery in the South. So did widely read antebellum Southern writer Hinton Helper, who declared that slavery, and nothing but slavery, has retarded the progress and prosperity of our portion of the Union. Just as they explained regional differences between whites by slavery, so many others in a later era would explain differences between blacks and whites nationwide by slavery. Plausible as these explanations may seem in both cases, they will not stand up under a closer scrutiny of history. It is perhaps understandable that the great overwhelming moral curse of slavery has presented a tempting causal explanation of the peculiar subculture of southern whites as well as that of blacks. 
Yet this same subculture had existed among southern whites and their ancestors in those parts of the British Isles from which they came, long before they had ever seen a black slave. The nature of this subculture, among people who were called rednecks and crackers in Britain before they ever saw America, needs to be explored before turning to the question of its current status among ghetto blacks and how developments in the larger society have affected its evolution. Emigration from Britain, like other migrations around the world, was not random in either its origins or its destinations. Most of the Britons who migrated to colonial Massachusetts, for example, came from within a 60-mile radius of the town of Haverhill in East Anglia. The Virginia aristocracy came from different localities in southern and western England. Most of the common white people of the South came from the northern borderlands of England. For centuries, a no-man's land between Scotland and England, as well as from the Scottish Highlands and from Ulster County, Ireland. All these fringe areas were turbulent, if not lawless, regions, where none of the contending forces was able to establish full control and create a stable order. Whether called a Celtic fringe or North Britons, these were people from outside the cultural heartland of England, as their behavior on both sides of the Atlantic showed. Before the era of modern transportation and communication, sharp regional differences were both common and persistent. In some of the counties of colonial Virginia, from nearly three-quarters to four-fifths of the people came from northern Britain, and similar proportions were found in some of the counties of Kentucky and Tennessee, as well as in parts of both the Carolinas. Although they predominated in many parts of the South, such people also had some northern enclaves in colonial America notably western Pennsylvania, where Ulster Scott settled. What is at least equally important as where particular people settled is when they emigrated from the borderlands, Ulster, and the Scottish Highlands. Scotland in particular progressed enormously in the 18th century. The level from which it began may be indicated by the fact that a visitor to late 18th century Edinburgh found it noteworthy that its residents no longer threw sewage from their chamber pots out their windows into the street something that passers-by had long had to be alert for, to avoid being splattered. Such crude and unsanitary living had long been characteristic of earlier times, when rural Scots lived in the same primitive shelters with their animals, and vermin abounded. A similar lack of concern with cleanliness was found among others in the borderlands of Britain, and among their descendants on the other side of the Atlantic in the antebellum south. For example, a 19th century politician built up a political machine in the poor white districts of Mississippi by such practices as this. He did not resort to any conventional tactics of kissing dirty babies, but he pleased mothers and fathers in log cabins by taking their children upon his lap and searching for red bugs, lice, and other vermin. Back in the British Isles, the life of the Scottish people was transformed dramatically from the masses to the elites, as they advanced from being one of the least educated to one of the most educated peoples in Europe. However, what is significant here is that much of the migration to the American South occurred before these sweeping social transformations. This timing was crucial, as Professor Grady McWhiney has pointed out in his book, Cracker Culture. Had the South been peopled by 19th century Scots, Welshmen, and Ulstermen, the course of Southern history would doubtless have been radically different. Nineteenth-century Scottish and Scotch-Irish immigrants did in fact fit quite comfortably into Northern American society. Significantly, the Irish, who retained their Celtic ways, did not. But only a trickle of the flood of nineteenth-century immigrants came into the South. The ancestors of the vast majority of Southerners arrived in America before the Anglicization of Scotland, Wales, and Ulster had advanced very far. In earlier centuries, Scotland was a poor and backward country, like Wales and Ireland, and like the turbulent northern borderlands of England, where the Scots and the English fought wars and committed atrocities against each other for centuries. Local feuding clans and freebooting marauders kept this region in an uproar, even when there were no military hostilities between the English and Scottish kingdoms. Ulster County had a different kind of turbulence, as the English and Scottish settlers there encountered the hostility and terrorist activities of the conquered, dispossessed, and embittered indigenous Irish population. These were the parts of Britain from which most people migrated to the American South, 
before the political and cultural unification of the British Isles or the standardization of the English language. The rednecks of these regions were what one social historian has called some of the most disorderly inhabitants of a deeply disordered land. In this world of impotent laws, daily dangers, and lives that could be snuffed out at any moment, the snatching at whatever fleeting pleasures presented themselves was at least understandable. Certainly prudence and long-range planning of one's life had no such payoff in this chaotic world as in more settled and orderly societies under the protection of effective laws. Books, businesses, technology, and science were not the kinds of things likely to be promoted or admired in the world of the rednecks and crackers. Manliness and the forceful projection of that manliness to others, and advertising of one's willingness to fight and even to put one's life on the line, were at least plausible means of gaining whatever measure of security was possible in a lawless region and a violent time. The kinds of attitudes and cultural values produced by centuries of living under such conditions did not disappear very quickly, even when social evolution in North America slowly and almost imperceptibly created a new and different world with different objective prospects. What the rednecks or crackers brought with them across the ocean was a whole constellation of attitudes, values, and behavior patterns that might have made sense in the world in which they had lived for centuries, but which would prove to be counterproductive in the world to which they were going, and counterproductive to the blacks who would live in their midst for centuries before emerging into freedom and migrating to the great urban centers of the United States, taking with them similar values. The cultural values and social patterns prevalent among Southern whites included an aversion to work, proneness to violence, neglect of education, sexual promiscuity, improvidence, drunkenness, lack of entrepreneurship, reckless searches for excitement, lively music and dance, and a style of religious oratory marked by strident rhetoric, unbridled emotions, and flamboyant imagery. This oratorical style carried over into the political oratory of the region in both the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights era, and has continued on into our own times among black politicians, preachers, and activists. Touchy pride, vanity, and boastful self-dramatization were also part of this redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. They boast and lack self-restraint, Olmsted said after observing their descendants in the American antebellum South. While Professor Grady McWhiney's cracker culture is perhaps the most thorough historical study of the values and behavioral patterns of white Southerners, many other scholarly studies have turned up very similar patterns, even when they differed in some ways as to the causes. Professor David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, for example, challenges the Celtic connection thesis put forth by Professor McWhiney but shows many of the same cultural patterns among the same people, both in Britain and in the American South. Popular writings of the 19th and 20th centuries have likewise described similar behavior, including the Indianapolis residents' comments on white Southern migrants to that city, which sounds so much like what many have said about ghetto blacks. None of this is meant to claim that these patterns have remained rigidly unchanged over the centuries, or that there are literally no differences between whites and blacks in any aspects of this subculture. However, what is remarkable is how pervasive and how close the similarities have been. Centuries before black pride became a fashionable phrase, there was cracker pride, and it was very much the same kind of pride. It was not pride in any particular achievement or set of behavioral standards or moral principles adhered to. It was instead a touchiness about anything that might be even remotely construed as a personal slight, much less an insult, combined with a willingness to erupt into violence over it. New Englanders were baffled about this kind of pride among crackers. Observing such people, the Yankees could not understand what they had to feel proud about. However, this kind of pride is perhaps best illustrated by an episode reported in Professor McWhiney's Cracker Culture. When an Englishman, tired of waiting for a Southerner to start working on a house he had contracted to build, hired another man to do the job, 
the enraged Southerner, who considered himself dishonored, vowed, Tomorrow morn I will come with men and twenty rifles, and I will have your life or you shall have mine. In the vernacular of our later times, he had been dissed, and he was not going to stand for it, regardless of the consequences for himself or others. The history of the antebellum South is full of episodes showing the same pattern, whether expressed in the highly formalized duels of the aristocracy or in the no-holds-barred style of fighting called rough and tumble among the common folk, a style that included biting off ears and gouging out eyes. It was not simply that particular isolated individuals did such things. Social approval was given to these practices, as illustrated by this episode in the antebellum South. A crowd gathered and arranged itself in an impromptu ring. The contestants were asked if they wished to fight fair or rough and tumble. When they chose rough and tumble, a roar of approval rose from the multitude. This particular fight ended with the loser's nose bitten off, his ears torn off, and both his eyes gouged out, after which the victor himself, maimed and bleeding, was chaired round the grounds to the cheers of the crowd. This rough-and-tumble style of fighting was also popular in the southern highlands of Scotland, where grabbing an opponent's testicles and attempting to castrate him by hand was also an accepted practice. Scottish Highlanders were, in centuries past, part of the Celtic fringe, or North Britons, outside the orbit of English culture, not only as it existed in England, but also in the Scottish lowlands. The Highlanders lagged far behind the Lowlanders in education and economic progress, as well as in the speaking of the English language, for Gaelic was still widely spoken by Highlanders in the 19th century, not only in Scotland itself, but also in North Carolina and in Australia, where immigrants from the Scottish Highlands were unable to communicate with English-speaking people, including Lowland Scots, who had also immigrated. In the Hebrides Islands off Scotland, Gaelic had still not completely died out in the middle of the 20th century. What is important in the pride and violence patterns among rednecks and crackers was not that particular people did particular things at particular times and places, nor is it necessary to attempt to quantify such behavior. What is crucial is that violence growing out of such pride had social approval. As Professor McWhiney pointed out, men often killed and went free in the South, just as in earlier times they had in Ireland and Scotland. As one observer in the South noted, enemies would meet, exchange insults, and one would shoot the other down, professing that he had acted in self-defense because he believed the victim was armed. When such a story was told in court, in a community where it is not a strange thing for men to carry about their person's deadly weapons, each member of the jury feels that he would have done the same thing under similar circumstances, so that in condemning him, they would but condemn themselves. The actions of Southern courts often amazed outsiders, Professor McWhiney said. But what may be even more revealing of widespread attitudes were the cases that never even went to trial. As another study of white Southerners put it, to many rural Southerners, rather than a set of legal statutes, justice remained a matter of societal norms allowing for respect of property rights, individual honor, and a maximum of personal independence. Any violation of this pattern amounted to a breach of justice requiring a specific response from the injured party. Upon learning that a youthful neighbor had approached his wife in an overly friendly manner, Robert Leard of Tangipahoa, Louisiana, promptly tracked the young man down and killed him. Under the Piney Woods Code of Justice, anything less would have invited shame and ridicule upon the Leard family. Intensity of personal pride was connected by Olmsted with the fiend-like street fights of the South. He mentioned an episode of public murder with impunity. A gentleman of veracity, now living in the South, told me that among his friends he had once numbered two young men, who were themselves intimate friends, till one of them, taking offense at some foolish words uttered by the other, challenges him. A large crowd assembled to see the duel, which took place on a piece of prairie ground. The combatants came armed with rifles, and at the first interchange of shots, the challenged man fell disabled by a ball in the thigh. The other, throwing down his rifle, walked toward him, and kneeling by his side, drew a bowie knife and deliberately butchered him.
The crowd of bystanders not only permitted this, but the execrable assassin still lives in the community, has since married, and, as far as my informant could judge, his social position has been rather advanced than otherwise from thus dealing with his enemy. Again, what is important here is not the isolated incident itself, but the set of social attitudes which allowed such incidents to take place publicly with impunity, the killer knowing in advance that what he was doing had community approval. Moreover, such attitudes went back for centuries on both sides of the Atlantic, at least among the particular people concerned. During the era when dueling became a pattern among upper-class Americans, between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, it was particularly prevalent in the South. As a social history of the United States noted, of Southern statesmen who rose to prominence after 1790, hardly one can be mentioned who was not involved in a duel. Editors of Southern newspapers became involved in duels so often that cartoonists depicted them with a pen in one hand and a dueling pistol in the other. Most duels arose not over substantive issues, but over words considered insulting. At lower social levels, Southern feuds such as that between the Hatfields and the McCoys, which began in a dispute over a pig and ultimately claimed more than 20 lives, became legendary. It has been estimated that, while at least three-quarters of the settlers in colonial New England originated in the lowland southeastern half of Britain, a similarly large proportion of the population of the South originated in the Scottish Highlands, Ireland, Wales, or the northern and western uplands of England. Those arriving from Ireland in colonial times would have been from Ulster County, where Scots and Englishmen settled, since substantial immigration of the indigenous Irish did not begin until near the middle of the 19th century. Radically different cultures could develop and persist during this era before transportation and communication developed to the point of promoting widespread interactions among people in different regions. In colonial America, the people of the English borderlands and of the Celtic fringe were seen by contemporaries as culturally quite distinct and were socially unwelcome. Mob action prevented a shipload of Ulster Scots from landing in Boston in 1719 and the Quaker leaders of eastern Pennsylvania encouraged Ulster Scots to settle out in western Pennsylvania, where they acted as a buffer to the Indians, as well as being a constant source of friction and conflict with the Indians. It was not just in the north that crackers and rednecks were considered to be undesirables. Southern plantation owners with poor whites living on adjoining land would often offer to buy their land for more than it was worth in order to be rid of such neighbors. Because there were no racial differences to form separate statistical categories for these North Britons and for other whites who settled in the South, or in particular enclaves elsewhere, indirect indicators must serve as proxies for these cultural differences. Names are among these indicators. Edward, for example, was a popular name in Virginia and in Wessex, England, from which many Virginians had emigrated. But the first 40 classes of undergraduates at Harvard College contained only one man named Edward. It would be nearly two centuries before Harvard enrolled anyone named Patrick, even though that was a common name in western Pennsylvania where the Ulster Scots settled. This says something not only about the social and geographic differences of the times, but also about how regionalized the naming patterns were then in contrast to the fact that no one today finds it particularly strange when an Asian-American has such non-Asian first names as Kevin or Michelle. Even where there was no conflict or hostility involved, Southerners often showed a reckless disregard for human life, including their own. For example, the racing of steamboats that happened to encounter each other on the rivers of the South often ended with exploding boilers, especially when the excited competition led to the tying down of safety valves in order to build up more pressure to generate more speed. An impromptu race between steamboats that encountered each other on the Mississippi illustrates the pattern. On board one boat was an old lady who, having bought a winter stock of bacon, pork, etc., was returning to her home on the banks of the Mississippi. Fun lovers on board both boats insisted upon a race, Cheers and drawn pistols obliged the captains to cooperate. As the boats struggled to outdistance each other, excited passengers demanded more speed. Despite every effort, the boats raced evenly until the old lady directed her slaves to throw all her casks of bacon into the boilers. <laughs>
Her boat then moved ahead of the other vessel, which suddenly exploded. Clouds of splinters and human limbs darkened the sky. On the undamaged boat, passengers shouted their victory. But above their cheers could be heard the shrill voice of the old lady, crying, I did it! I did it! It's all my bacon! On the Mississippi and other western rivers of the United States, as it existed in the early 19th century, it has been estimated that 30% of all the steamboats were lost in accidents. Part of this may have been due to deficiencies in the early steamboats themselves, but much of it was due to the recklessness with which they were operated on southern rivers. The comments of a fireman on a Mississippi steamboat of that era may suggest why a river voyage was considered more dangerous than crossing the Atlantic, at a time when sinkings in the Atlantic were by no means rare. Talk about northern steamers, the fireman of a Mississippi steamboat sneered to an eastern traveler in 1844. It don't need no spunk to navigate them waters. You ain't bust a biler in five years. But I tell you, stranger, it takes a man to ride one of these half-alligator boats, head on a snag, high pressures, valve soldered down, 600 souls on board, and in danger of going to the devil. This was no mere idle talk. Among the steamboat explosions in the South, one on the Mississippi in 1838 killed well over a hundred people and another near Baton Rouge in 1859 killed more than half of the 400 people on board and badly injured more than half the survivors. Southerners were just as reckless on land, whether in escapades undertaken for the excitement of the moment or in the many fights and deaths resulting from some insult or slight among people touchy about their honor and dignity. Again, all of this went back to a way of life in the turbulent regions of Britain from which white Southerners came nor is it hard to recognize in these attitudes clear parallels to the behavior and attitudes of ghetto gangs today who kill over a look or a word or any action that can be construed as dissing them. Pride had yet another side to it. Among the definitions of a cracker in the Oxford Dictionary is a braggart, one who talks trash in today's vernacular, a wisecracker. More than mere wisecracks were involved, however, the pattern is one said by Professor McWhiney to go back to descriptions of ancient Celts as boasters and threateners and given to bombastic self-dramatization. Examples today come readily to mind, not only from ghetto life and gangster rap, but also from militant black leaders, spokesmen, or activists. What is painfully ironic is that such attitudes and behavior are projected today as aspects of a distinctive black identity when in fact they are part of a centuries-old pattern among the whites in whose midst generations of blacks lived in the South. Any broad-brush discussion of cultural patterns must, of course, not claim that all people, whether white or black, had the same culture, much less to the same degree. There are not only changes over time, there are cross-currents at any given time. Nevertheless, it is useful to see the outlines of a general pattern, even when that pattern erodes over time and at varying rates among different subgroups. The violence for which white Southerners became most lastingly notorious was lynching. Like other aspects of the redneck and cracker culture, it has often been attributed to race or slavery. In fact, however, most lynching victims in the antebellum South were white. Economic considerations alone would prevent a slave owner from lynching his own slave or tolerating anyone else's doing so. It was only after the Civil War that the emancipated blacks became the principal targets of lynching. But by then, Southern vigilante violence had been a tradition for more than a century in North America, and even longer back in the regions of Britain from which crackers and rednecks came, where retributive justice was often left in private hands. Even the burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan has been traced back to the fiery cross of old Scotland, used by feuding clans. Observers of the white population of the antebellum South often commented not only on their poverty, but also on their lack of industriousness or entrepreneurship. A contemporary characterized many white Southerners as too poor to keep slaves and too proud to work. A landmark history of agriculture in the antebellum South described the poor whites this way. They cultivated in a casual and careless fashion small patches of corn or rice, 
sweet potatoes, cow peas, and garden products. Women and children did a large part of the work. The men spent their time principally in hunting or idleness. The men were inveterate drunkards, and sometimes the women joined them in drinking inferior whiskey. Licentiousness was prevalent among them. Among their equals, the men were quarrelsome and inclined to crimes of violence. The poor whites were densely ignorant. Their labors tended to be intermittent, often when they were pressed for money rather than a steady employment career. Frederick Law Olmsted called it lazy poverty, with whatever work they did being done in a thoughtless manner. Summarizing his observations in the antebellum South, Olmsted said, I know that while men seldom want an abundance of coarse food in the cotton states, the proportion of the free white men who live as well in any aspect as our working classes in the North, on an average, is small, and that the citizens of the cotton states, as a whole, are poor. They work little, and that little, badly. They earn little, they sell little, they buy little, and they have little, very little, of the common comforts and consolations of civilized life. Their destitution is not material only, it is intellectual and it is moral. When Olmsted found work done efficiently, promptly, and well during his travels through the South, when he found well-run businesses, good libraries, impressive churches, and efficiently functioning institutions in general, he almost invariably found them to be run by Northerners, foreigners, or Jews. Nor was he the only visiting observer to reach such conclusions. Another observed that nearly all of the Old South's successful storekeepers were either Yankees or Yankee-trained Southerners. A French visitor said that, when you saw a plantation in better condition than others, you would often discover that it was owned by someone from the North. A history of Southern agriculture presented this picture of North Carolina in the early 18th century. Many of the inhabitants were rough borderers who lived a crude, half-savage existence. Some were herdsmen, dependent mainly on the product of the range and under the necessity of eating meat without bread. There were also many thriftless and lazy families who had been attracted to the country by the mild climate and the ease with which a bare livelihood could be obtained by hunting and fishing, raising a little corn and keeping a few head of swine, and possibly a cow or two on the range. On the other hand, there were small farmers, many of northern or European extraction, living industrious and thrifty lives amidst a rude abundance and considerable diversity of food supplies. They maintained good-sized herds of cattle, swine, and sheep, and the women made butter and cheese. Borderers, at that point, would refer to people from the borderlands of Britain, those included in what Professor McWhiney and others have called the Celtic Fringe, and what Professor Fisher called North Britons. While the making of butter and cheese might seem to be an unremarkable activity in most rural communities, butter and cheese making by these farmers of non-Southerner origins was in fact exceptional in the South. One of Frederick Law Olmsted's complaints during his travels through the antebellum South was the scarcity of butter, despite all the cows he saw. Even among plantation owners, he said, as for butter, some have heard of it, some have seen it, but few have eaten it. Hard data support his conclusions about the scarcity of butter in the antebellum South, despite an abundance of cows. In 1860, the South had 40% of all the dairy cows in the country, but produced just 20% of the butter and only 1% of the cheese. As a study of antebellum Southern agriculture noted, attempts to stimulate greater attention to commercial production were futile and even the bluegrass regions imported a large proportion of the cheese consumed. The study concluded, In short, while the South abounded in cattle, the reported production of dairy products was very small. A table based on census statistics shows that some of the southern states, such as Texas and Florida, had far more cattle per capita than important dairy states like Vermont and New York. And in most of the southern states, cattle per capita were nearly or quite as numerous as in the northern states. Yet the production of butter and cheese per capita in most of the southern states was insignificant as compared with per capita production in the principal northeastern states. A speaker before an agricultural society in Orange County, North Carolina said, 
It is a reproach to us as farmers, and no little deduction from our wealth, that we suffer the population of our towns and villages to supply themselves with butter from another Orange County in New York. In colonial times, butter was imported from as far away as Ireland. Where butter was not imported, it was often produced locally by people of non-Southern origins. As a scholarly history of Southern agriculture reported, in 1858, the dairies producing whole milk for the city of Louisville, Kentucky, were described as probably as well conducted as any in the country, but almost without exception, managed by Swiss or German operatives. Meanwhile, a newspaper in South Carolina said in 1857, Good butter is indeed a luxury to almost every planter in the southern country, and there is, perhaps, no one article of food that is more eagerly sought after. In antebellum Virginia, a Richmond newspaper likewise complained of the scarcity of good butter, saying that the quality of butter available in the local market would hardly be thought good enough to grease a cartwheel. When considering legislation to try to remedy the situation, a member of the Virginia legislature attributed the poor quality of that state's butter to the carelessness with which Virginia farmers prepared it. One reason for the contrast between the abundance of butter and cheese produced by German farmers in states like Wisconsin, for example, and the scarcity of butter and cheese in the South was that German farmers, wherever they were located, tended to build fences and huge barns for their livestock and to feed them there during the winter. Southerners more often let their cows and hogs roam freely during the winter, even though this meant that in the spring they turned up half starved and it took the summer for them to put on normal weight. This, too, was a continuation of patterns found among their ancestors in the British Isles and was part of a more general pattern of carelessness. Many other observers noticed the broken fences and the stunted cattle running at large, unfed and unprotected. Their manure was put to no use. Artificial pasture long remained a rarity, and few farmers stored feed for the winter. In Virginia, a French traveler of the late 17th century saw poor beasts of a morning all covered with snow and trembling with the cold. But no forage was provided for them. They eat the bark of the trees because the grass was covered. Wild animals, wolves, bears, and savage dogs attacked the helpless cattle and made the raising of sheep difficult. Germans were better able than Southerners to milk their cows regularly and prepare dairy products while cows owned by Southerners were more likely to run dry after calves were weaned. A contemporary observer said that even Southern farmers with many cows will not give themselves the trouble of milking more than will maintain their family. As late as the 1930s, a scholar studying the geography and economy of the South wrote, The close attention to duty, the habits of steady, skillful routine accepted by butterfat producers of Wisconsin as a matter of fact, are traits not yet present in Southern culture. At that point, the Southern states, with 26% of the country's dairy cows, produced just 7% of processed dairy products such as butter, cheese, ice cream, and condensed milk. There was a similar contrast between German farmers and Southern farmers when it came to clearing land for farming back in pioneering days. Germans cleared frontier land by both chopping down trees and laboriously removing their stumps and roots, so that all the land could be plowed thereafter. Southerners more often cut down the tree, or even simply girdled it and left it to die and rot, but in any case, leaving the stump in the ground and plowing around it. Although the erosion-prone soils of the southern uplands have been blamed for the poverty of the whites living on them, nevertheless on that same land, Germans were able to cultivate the hill soil so as to avoid erosion and were willing to expend upon it the additional labor which its topography required, so that these soils in their hands yielded excellent regular returns. Comments on the lack of enterprise by southern whites were made by numerous observers in various parts of the South. In Alexis de Tocqueville's classic, Democracy in America, he contrasted the attitudes toward work among Southern and Northern whites as being so great as to be visible to the casual observer sailing down the Ohio River and comparing the Ohio side with the Kentucky side. These were not just the prejudices of outsiders. No Southern man, South Carolina's famed Senator John C. Calhoun said, 
not even the poorest or the lowest, will, under any circumstances, perform menial labor. He has too much pride for that. General Robert E. Lee likewise declared, Our people are opposed to work. Our troops, officers, community, and press, all ridicule and resist it. Many whites, according to a leading Southern historian, were disposed to leave good enough alone and put off changes till the morrow. Very similar kinds of comments were made about these Southerners' ancestors in the parts of the British Isles from which they came. Although the term lazy appears frequently in comments on these people on both sides of the Atlantic, there has been no evidence of any such aversion on their part to strenuous physical activity in dancing, fighting, hunting, and other recreational activities, so sloth was not the real issue nor have rednecks or crackers been prominent in such less physically demanding activities as entrepreneurship or scholarship. It is the nature of the particular activities in which they have taken an active interest and on which they have expended their energies, rather than the physical demands of those activities, that seems to have been crucial. Not only did many of the groups who settled in the South disdain business as a career, as their ancestors had in those parts of Britain from which they came, they typically lack the kinds of habits necessary to be successful in business. Among the habits needed to run a business, none is more basic than a steady application to the tasks at hand, doing things in a business-like way. But those relatively few Southerners who did run businesses often displayed no such business-like attitudes. Even when there was business to transact, Southerners would often stop to go watch a cockfight or a parade or visit a saloon or go hunting. In traveling in the South, a northern visitor commented in the 1850s, you become astonished at the little attention men pay to their business. Such views were not confined to northerners, however, nor to urban businesses. According to a noted history of the antebellum South, the Richmond Enquirer attributed the success of northern farmers where southerners had failed to the social nature of the latter, which led them to gather round the courthouse and country stores to smoke, chew, talk politics, and, in general, to waste time. Many Southern businessmen were unreliable about either paying their bills or delivering goods and services when promised. Among Southerners in general, their improvident spending and the indebtedness to which it often led was widely commented on in the United States and in the places from which their ancestors came in Britain. Even large Southern plantation owners with lavish lifestyles were often deeply in debt, among the Virginia gentry, extravagant and even ruinous bets on horses were common, according to a scholarly study. Nor were Southerners alert to profitable investment prospects, according to observers in the antebellum South. For example, although there were large coal deposits and a beautiful quality of marble near Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the people there bought coal from Philadelphia, and marble for tombstones was imported from Italy. In antebellum Virginia, as well, Olmsted observed the natural resources of the land were strangely unused or were used with poor economy. Nor was he alone in that conclusion. A 20th century scholar also commented on the coal available in Alabama. The Alabama Iron District is one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, iron district in the entire world. It possesses a phenomenal natural equipment, Jutting out of the hillsides that flank one side of the broad, open valley are thick deposits of iron ore. On the other side of the valley are the coal mines and coke ovens, and the limestone is at hand. Instead of carrying ore a thousand miles, as at Pittsburgh and the English furnaces, or fuel six hundred miles, as at Lake Champlain, the raw materials for these southern furnaces are shifted across the valley by switching engines, and the local supply of cheap black labor helps to give a wonderfully low cost. Yet it was more than 20 years after the Civil War before Birmingham became an iron and steel production center. As for the reasons for the belated development of such a promising combination of natural resources, in spite of the favors of geography, the iron and steel industry in the South was slow, in its beginnings and development. Like everything Southern, the industry was retarded by lack of capital and technical skill. Capital was available from outside the South, or indeed from outside the country, as foreign capital was used to finance the building of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Illinois Central during the same era. 
but the other factors had to be there to create a promising prospect of profitability that would attract investment. The difficulties of developing those other factors in Alabama was shown by the fact that in 1888, Birmingham saw its first ton of steel run through the furnaces of the Henderson Steel Company and burn out the crude furnace linings in the process. Early explorers and settlers in the antebellum South wrote in glowing terms of the wild fruits, especially the wild grapes of unusual size which excited extravagant hopes of the development of wine industries. Yet early attempts to find a market for southern wine in Britain were ruined by the fact that a sample of wine that was sent across the Atlantic spoiled in the musty casks in which southerners had carelessly shipped it. Later efforts to establish a wine industry in the South were undertaken by foreigners, French, German, and Portuguese. A German settlement in Missouri created a wine industry with an annual output of about 100,000 gallons, but the South as a whole produced less than one-fifth of the wine in the United States in 1849, and this was long before the development of the California wine industry. As late as the beginning of the 20th century, there were still laments about the opportunities in the South missed by Southerners and put to use by outsiders with different patterns of behavior. Landowners in Alabama were said to have cheated themselves out of millions of dollars by failing to see the opportunities within their grasp, which lumbermen from the north and east seized by cutting trees and shipping the lumber around the world. Some Southerners along the Gulf Coast likewise spoke of the golden opportunities which they failed to grasp, of the numerous successes of northern and eastern men, and lamented the passing of the old school of gentlemen, the midday mint juleps, and the easygoing business methods. Some of these Southerners, however, seemed to prosper working shoulder to shoulder with the Yankees. Not only in the South, but in the communities from which white Southerners had come in the Scottish Highlands, in Ulster and in Wales of an earlier era, most of the successful businessmen were outsiders. Even the poorest Highland Scots would not skin their horses when they died. Instead, Scots sold their dead horses for three pence to English soldiers, who in turn got six pence for the skinned carcass and another two shillings for the hide. This was not due to a lack of knowledge of skinning. In earlier times, when Scotland and England were at war, one of the atrocities committed by the Scots was skinning captured English officers alive. During the 16th century border feuds, the Johnston-Johnson clan adorned their houses with the flayed skins of their enemies, the Maxwells. It was not the skill that was lacking, but the enterprise. Contemporary observers commented on another peculiarity of antebellum Southerners fording rivers and streams instead of building bridges over them. Nor was this due simply to poverty. A biography of famed 19th century congressman John Randolph of Virginia referred to the bridgeless streams in the area where elite families like his lived. Thomas Jefferson noted that he had to cross eight rivers between Monticello and Washington, five of which had neither bridges nor boats. This peculiarity was noted in other parts of the South and by observers in those parts of Britain from which Southerners came. Commenting on just how lazy Southerners were, one man noted that no northern farmer would neglect to build a bridge over a stream that crossed his property. Indeed, two live Yankees would complete the work in a single day. But the southern planter will ford the creek lying between his house and stable a whole lifetime. The same complaint was made about Highland Scots, whose roads were equally bad as those of Ireland and the Old South. In the 1790s, a minister, noting that fords, rather than bridges, crossed streams on one of the most heavily traveled roads in the Highlands, wrote, From a desire to save labor or time, the ford is often attempted when the river is too high, and the consequence is frequently fatal. Again, it is necessary to emphasize that the culture which Southerners brought over from the parts of Britain from which they came changed in Britain in the years after they left. But all this happened after the ancestors of rednecks and crackers had immigrated to the American South from the outer regions of British society, rather than from central England. Given the historical background of crackers and rednecks in Britain, it could hardly be expected that intellectual activity would be a major interest of theirs in the United States. A study of 18,000 county records from 17th century colonial Virginia showed that nearly half of all the white male Virginians were so illiterate that they could not sign their names. 
and simply made a mark on legal documents. While the small Virginia aristocracy were often well-educated and had impressive collections of books in their homes, these books were typically imported from England rather than purchased from local bookstores. Thomas Jefferson complained that the area where he lived was without a single bookstore. As late as the census of 1850, more than one-fifth of Southern whites were still illiterate, compared to less than 1% of New Englanders. In the Southern backcountry, Levels of schooling were lower here than any other part of the United States, according to a landmark historical study, and there were no institutions comparable to New England's town schools. Although the white population of the South was only one-half as large as that of the North, the total number of illiterate whites in the South in 1850 was larger than the total number of illiterates in the North. In the antebellum era, the total circulation of northern newspapers was more than four times the total circulation of southern newspapers. Moreover, many editors of southern newspapers were themselves from the north. The north had four times as many schools, attended by more than four times as many pupils. Children in Massachusetts spent more than twice as many years in school as children in Virginia. When it came to inventions, only 8% of the patents issued in 1852 went to residents of the southern states, whose white population was approximately one-third of the white population of the country. Even in agriculture, the main economic activity of the region, only 9 out of 62 patents for agricultural implements went to southerners. The cotton gin, perhaps the most crucial invention for the antebellum south, was invented by a northerner. A Southerner said to Frederick Law Olmsted, The fact is, sir, the people here are not like you northern people. They don't reason out everything so. Olmsted himself likewise concluded from his travels in the antebellum South that Southerners were greatly disinclined to exact and careful reasoning. As late as the First World War, white soldiers from Georgia, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Mississippi scored lower on mental tests than black soldiers from Ohio Illinois, New York, and Pennsylvania. At higher levels of achievement, the contrast between the South and other regions was even more stark. A study of leading American figures in the arts and sciences in the first half of the 19th century found most clustered in the Northeast, while vast regions of the South, Virginia alone excepted, were without a single one. The kinds of statistical disparities found between Southern whites and Northern whites in the past are today often taken as evidence or proof of racial discrimination when such disparities are found between the black and white populations of the country as a whole, while others have taken such disparities as signs of genetic deficiencies. Yet clearly, neither racial discrimination nor racial inferiority can explain similar differences between whites in the North and the South in earlier centuries. This should at least raise questions about such explanations when applied to blacks of a later era who inherited the culture of white Southerners. Southern whites were as different from Northern whites when it came to sexual patterns as they were in other ways. Widespread casual sex was commented on by outside observers in both the American South and in those parts of Britain from which Southerners had come. Here again, the greatest contrast is with New England. While pregnant brides were very rare in 17th century New England, they were more common in the southern backcountry than anywhere else in the United States. A missionary estimated that more than nine-tenths of the backcountry women at whose weddings he officiated were already pregnant. In this, as in other respects, the sexual customs of the southern backcountry were similar to those of northwestern England. Meanwhile, the region of England from which New Englanders came had the lowest rates of illegitimacy in England, just as their descendants had the lowest rates of illegitimacy in the United States. Women dressed more revealingly in the South, and both sexes spoke more freely about sex than was common in New England. In the 17th century, most Virginia girls found a husband by the age of 17, while in Massachusetts, the average age at which women married was 23. In that era, fornication and rape were acts severely punished in New England. Rape was a hanging offense in New England, while in the Chesapeake Bay colonies, it was sometimes punished less severely than petty theft. <laughs>
As with other North-South differences, differences in sexual behavior have often been attributed to the existence of slavery in the South, due in this case to the opportunities which this presented for sexual exploitation of slave women. But again, history shows the same patterns among the same people and their ancestors in Britain before they had ever seen a black woman. In colonial Virginia as well, the sexual exploitation of white indentured servant girls was common before the slave population had grown large enough for white servant girls to be replaced by black women. Religious denominations, practices, and churches differed as between the crackers and rednecks of the South and those of the white population in the rest of the country. As in other things, the greatest contrast was with the role of religion in New England. This did not mean that there was uniformity across the South, for the Virginia elite tended to be Anglicans, and there were also Quakers in the South, for example. But most Southerners were either Baptists or Methodists. Those Northerners or foreigners who visited the South found the style and manner of religion among most white Southerners distinct and distasteful. These visitors viewed with contempt people who whooped and hollered, chewed and spit tobacco in church. Many Southern religious gatherings were not held in churches, but at outdoor camp meetings, a style that went back to practices of these Southerners' ancestors in Britain. So, too, did the oratorical style of Southern preachers and the behavior of their congregations, whether in churches or outdoors. Frederick Law Olmsted's description of a typical preacher in the antebellum South noted that the speaker nearly all the time cried aloud at the utmost stretch of his voice, as if calling to someone a long distance off, that he was gifted with a strong imagination and possessed of a good deal of dramatic power, that he had the habit of frequently repeating a phrase, and that he exhibited a dramatic talent that included leaning far over the desk with his arms stretched forward, gesticulating violently, yelling at the highest key, and catching his breath with an effort. Similar scenes were described a century earlier in Virginia, and at a camp meeting in Scotland, where the preacher was sweating, bawling, jumping, and beating the desk. This melodramatic and emotional oratorical style could still be seen in 20th century America, not only in religious services, but also in politics, both among white Southern politicians of the Jim Crow era and among black leaders of the civil rights movement in the South and community activists in the Northern ghettos. By contrast, religious services in colonial Massachusetts developed what has been called the meeting and lecture approach, where the style of preaching was a relentless cultivation of the plain style. These addresses tended to be closely argued statements of great density, in which Puritans reasoned as relentlessly with their Maker as they did with one another. This intellectual approach to religion carried over into their daily lives. Even more than most people in their time, they searched constantly for clues to God's purposes in the world. It was this impulse which led so many English Puritans to study nature with that extraordinary intensity which played a central part in the birth of modern science. There was a dark side to this intensity as well. The vast majority of the persecutions and executions of women for witchcraft occurred in New England. Quakers did not have the persecuting intolerance of the Puritans, but they too had plain-spoken religious meetings, also in contrast to melodramatic services among the rednecks and crackers of the South. The Anglican services were likewise less emotional and dramatic, but Anglicanism in the South was largely confined to the Tidewater region. Catholics, too, had a quieter service, though more formal than the Quakers, but there was little Catholicism in the South, where even Irish immigrants tended to become absorbed into the Protestant religions, just as the Scots tended to become absorbed into Southern fundamentalist religions. The South was a region lacking the prerequisites for maintaining an educated clergy, as required by both Presbyterians and Catholics. Anyone familiar with religious practices among black Americans today will recognize the clear imprint of the white Southern pattern. It was not just the Southern preachers who behaved differently from their counterparts in other parts of the country. So did the congregations. While many of those listening to hellfire and damnation sermons were moved to extreme emotional reactions of fear, confession, and repentance, many others took these sermons as dramatic performances or spectacles, and 
and the young women and men often treated these religious gatherings as occasions for socializing and preludes to romantic encounters later. This pattern, too, went back to earlier centuries in Scotland, where, while some at the camp meetings were groaning, sighing, and weeping for their sins, there was usually also a knot of young fellows and girls making assignations to go home together in the evening or to meet in some alehouse. While the keeping of the Sabbath as a day free of worldly activities and amusements was a common practice in many parts of the United States in centuries past, that was not the practice among the rednecks and crackers of the antebellum South. Southerners had fun on Sundays, to the consternation of Northern observers. One of the strangest sights to a New England man on visiting Southern states is the desecration of the Sabbath, wrote a Yankee. In some of the cities, especially if a good number of the businessmen are from the North, the churches are tolerably well attended, there being but one sermon for the day. But even here, the afternoon and evening are much devoted to amusements. Another Northerner declared that in the South, there is no Sabbath. They work, run, swear, and drink here on Sundays, just as they do on any other day of the week. Many Southerners did not go to church at all, or did so intermittently or when not distracted by other activities. Again, this was a pattern found among their ancestors in Britain. Among the reasons given by contemporaries for low church attendance among Southerners was that they often got drunk on Saturday night and were in no condition to go to church on Sunday morning. Much of the cultural pattern of Southern rednecks became the cultural heritage of Southern blacks, more so than survivals of African cultures with which they had not been in contact for centuries. Even in colonial times, most blacks on American soil had been born on American soil. Moreover, such cultural traits followed blacks out of the Southern countrysides and into the urban ghettos, North and South, where many settled. The very way of talking, later to be christened Black English, closely followed dialects brought over from those parts of Britain from which many white Southerners came, though these speech patterns died out in Britain while surviving in the American South, as such speech patterns would later die out among most Southern whites and among middle-class blacks, while surviving in the poorer black ghettos around the country. For example, where a Northerner said, I am, you are, she isn't, it doesn't, and I haven't, a Virginian, even of high rank, preferred to say, I be, you be, she ain't, it don't, and I ain't. These Virginia speech ways were not invented in America. They derived from a family or regional dialects that had been spoken throughout the South and West of England during the 17th century. From these same regions of England came such words as yaller for yellow, axe for ask, across for across, y'all for you, Bile for boil, dough for door, dis for this, and that for that. Many of these usages have long since died out in England, though the word chitlins for hog entrails continued to be used in some localities in England, even in the 20th century, as such usage remained common among black Americans. But no such words came from Africa, nor did the holiday Kwanzaa, which originated in Los Angeles. The slaves' custom of marking their marriages by jumping over a broomstick, a custom resurrected at a posh wedding among blacks in 20th century New York as a mark of racial identity, was in fact a pagan custom in Europe in centuries past and survived for a time among Southern whites. Complaints about the improvidence of whites in the South and of their ancestors in Britain before that were echoed in W.E.B. Du Bois's picture of his fellow blacks in the 1890s. Probably few poor nations waste more money by thoughtless and unreasonable expenditure than the American Negro, and especially those living in large cities. Thousands of dollars are annually wasted in amusements of various kinds and in miscellaneous ornaments and gewgaws. The Negro has much to learn of the Jew and the Italian as to living within his means and saving every penny from excessive and wasteful expenditures. It was not, however, from Jews or Italians that blacks had absorbed their culture. Du Bois's description of the spending habits of blacks in the 1890s was echoed by a contemporary observer, Jacob Rees, who said that the Negro loves fine clothes and good living a good deal more than he does a bank account. <laughs> 
Similar observations have been made by many others over the years, inside and outside the black community. For the lower socioeconomic classes among blacks, Gunnar Myrdal's descriptions of them near the middle of the 20th century still bore a remarkable resemblance to descriptions of Southern whites and their regional forebears in Britain, including less resourcefulness, disorganized family life, lax sexual morals, and recklessness, with tendencies toward aggression and violence. Despite a generally sympathetic approach to the study of blacks in his landmark book, An American Dilemma, which has often been credited with a major influence on the advancement of civil rights, Myrdal also noted the low standards of efficiency, reliability, ambition, and morals actually displayed by the average Negro. He observed something of the devil-may-care attitude in the pleasure-seeking of Negroes, and a general attitude in which life becomes cheap and crime not so reprehensible. Like other observers, Myrdal tended to attribute to slavery such aspects of black culture as the low regard for human life, when in fact antebellum whites had exhibited this same reckless disregard of lethal dangers and so had their ancestors in Britain. Unlike many others, however, Myrdal also recognized the influence of the southern white culture on the culture of blacks pointing out that the general Southern pattern of illegality maintained this low regard for human life. He also noted that the so-called Negro dialect is simply a variation on the ordinary Southern accent, that religious emotionalism was borrowed from and sanctioned by religious behavior among whites in the South, and that the Negro trait of audaciousness is characteristic of white Southerners too. He quoted black scholar and later statesman Ralph Bunch, White Southerners employ many of the defense mechanisms characteristic of the Negro. They often carry a chip on the shoulder. They indulge freely in self-commiseration. They rather typically, and in real Negro fashion, try to overcome a feeling of inferiority by exhibitionism, raucousness in dress, and exaggerated self-assertion. Although Dr. Bunch presented these as parallels, historically it was, of course, the Southern whites who first had these patterns reflecting patterns among their ancestors in Britain. In much of the literature on black culture, however, the supposed influence of slavery has been far more sweepingly assumed, and the cultural influence of white Southerners and their forebears in Britain largely ignored. Attempts to derive the black manner of speaking from slavery and its parallel among whites as an influence from black speech were answered by a Southern historian who asked, from whence came the drawl of the people of the upper Great Plains and of the Blue Ridge, Smoky, and Cumberland Mountains, who have had little or no contact with the Negro? Another cultural historian of Southerners aptly observed that Southerners, white and black, share the bonds of a common heritage, indeed a common tragedy, and often speak a common language, however seldom they may acknowledge it. Half a century after Myrdal, Another study of racial attitudes noted the intimidating ethnic style of many underclass black males and noted that nearly half of all murder victims in America were black and that 94% of them were killed by other blacks. Many of these killings were due to gang members who killed for such reasons as cause he look at me funny, cause he give me no respect, and other reasons reminiscent of the touchy pride and hair-trigger violence of rednecks and crackers in an earlier era. The neglect and disdain of education found among antebellum white Southerners has been echoed not only in low performance levels among ghetto blacks, but perhaps most dramatically in a hostility toward those black students who are conscientious about their studies, who are accused of acting white, a charge that can bring anything from social ostracism to outright violence. So much attention has been paid to questions of ability that few have looked at cultural attitudes. One of those who has is black professor and best-selling author Shelby Steele, who sees in many of these children almost a determination not to learn, even though, once outside the school and in their own neighborhoods, these same children learn everything. He drew on his own experiences teaching at a university. For some years, I have noticed that I can walk into any of my classes on the first day of the semester, identify the black students, and be sadly confident that on the last day of the semester a disproportionate number of them will be at the bottom of the class, far behind any number of white students of equal or even lesser ability. Statistical data substantiate these impressions, 
black students typically perform academically below the level of those white students with the same mental test scores. In contrast to Asian American students, who perform better than white students with the same test scores as themselves. In short, even though black students average lower test scores than either white or Asian American students, those test scores are not necessarily the sole, nor perhaps even the predominant, reason for lower black academic achievement. Indeed, it is possible that the lower test scores may be a result of cultural attitudes and of actions or inactions over a period of years based on those attitudes, more so than a cause of academic failures. While it has long been known that, historically, the average IQ of blacks has been about 85, compared to a national average of 100, what has not been so widely known is that the average IQ of blacks in the North was for years consistently higher than that of blacks in the South. A 1942 study of freshmen at black colleges found the superiority of freshmen from northern schools over those from southern schools was found to persist throughout the colleges. As already noted, black soldiers from some northern states scored higher on mental tests than whites from some southern states during the First World War. From that same era, European immigrants from cultures where education was not a high priority for ordinary people, parts of eastern and southern Europe, for example, scored no higher on mental tests than American blacks, and, in some communities, their children scored lower than northern black children attending the same schools. The low test scores of some European immigrant children cannot be automatically attributed to their being new to the United States. There have been settled communities of whites with test scores similar to those of blacks, where these have been culturally isolated people, such as the inhabitants of the Hebrides Islands off Scotland, or people living in Tennessee mountain communities, hillbillies, or inhabitants of canal boat communities in Britain. In short, some kinds of cultures tend to produce lower mental test scores, whether the people in those cultures are black or white, American or European. As someone has aptly said, the tests are not unfair. Life is unfair, and the tests measure the results. No one chooses which culture to be born into, or can be blamed for how that culture evolved in centuries past. In business ownership, as in other ways, the pattern among black Americans has followed the pattern of rednecks in earlier times, with people from other groups owning most of the businesses in black neighborhoods. Some may try to explain the lack of locally owned businesses in the ghettos by racial discrimination or poverty, but as early as the 1920s, there were numerous black-owned businesses in Harlem, the majority of which were owned by blacks from the Caribbean, not blacks from the American South, who were the majority population of Harlem. Although New York was the principal destination of blacks from the Caribbean, then as now, the 1930 census showed that there were more than four times as many native-born blacks in Manhattan as there were foreign-born blacks. In a parallel to differences between Southern and non-Southern whites, a study of West Indian blacks in the United States noted that the Negro immigrants, particularly the British West Indians, bring a zest of learning that is not typical of the native-born population. While black Americans have long been overrepresented among people in prison, a study of the racial composition of New York State's Sing Sing prison in the early 1930s found that black West Indians were underrepresented relative to their share of the population, at a time when native-born black Americans were overrepresented several-fold among Sing Sing inmates. During that same era, when American-born black women and West Indian black women both worked in New York City's garment district, the latter were more frequently found at the skilled tasks, more generally, the study found that the black immigrant brings a cultural heritage that is vastly different from that of the American Negro. The first black borough presidents of Manhattan were West Indians. As late as 1970, the highest-ranking blacks in New York's police department were West Indians, as were all the black federal judges in the city. The 1970 census showed that black West Indian families in the New York metropolitan area had 28% higher incomes than the families of American blacks. The incomes of second-generation West Indian families living in the same area exceeded that of black families by 58%. Neither race nor racism can explain such differences. Nor can slavery, since native-born blacks and West Indian blacks both had a history of slavery 
Studies published in 2004 indicated that an absolute majority of the black alumni of Harvard were either West Indian or African immigrants, or the children of these immigrants. Somewhat similar findings have emerged in studies of some other elite colleges. With blacks, as with whites, the redneck culture has been a less achieving culture. Moreover, that culture has affected a higher proportion of the black population than of the white population, since only about one-third of all whites lived in the antebellum South, while nine-tenths of all blacks did. From the 1960s onward, much of the transplanted Southern culture would, like black English, be seen as sacrosanct features of a distinctive black identity, despite their mirroring very similar cultural patterns among Southern whites in times past. Not all black Americans, of course, retain this anachronistic culture, for the spread of education and the growing experience of the counterproductive effects of the Southern redneck way of life eroded it over time for many blacks, as happened also among the whites who brought this culture over from Britain. Even during the era of slavery, those blacks who were house servants in more educated homes tended to pick up a different culture, giving their descendants enduring advantages over the descendants of field hands. Contemporary black ghetto culture in the United States is not, however, a simple linear extrapolation from the culture of Southern whites. First of all, most black Americans today are no longer part of the ghetto culture. Moreover, aside from influences peculiar to the circumstances of blacks, profound changes in the larger American society around them have also had an influence, both positive and negative. The burgeoning of the American welfare state in the second half of the 20th century and the declining effectiveness of the American criminal justice system at the same time allowed borrowed and counterproductive cultural traits to continue and flourish among those blacks who had not yet moved beyond that culture, thereby prolonging the life of a chaotic, counterproductive, dangerous, and self-destructive subculture in many urban ghettos. Crime and violence were among the features of this subculture that were artificially prolonged. Prior to the 1960s, while black males had a higher murder rate than other males, their murder rate was also declining more sharply than the general murder rate. Subsequently, the general murder rate in the United States and the murder rate for black males both reversed and began rising sharply, that of black males more sharply than others. In short, the drastic changes in law enforcement and social morality during the 1960s had particularly adverse effects on the behavior and actions of blacks and on black victims of the criminals in their midst. Intellectuals have also played a role, along with the welfare state, in prolonging and legitimizing a counterproductive culture among blacks. Nowhere was the effect of the white liberalism of the 1960s on the social evolution of black culture more devastating than in the disintegration of the black family. The raw facts are these. As of 1960, 51% of black females between the ages of 15 and 44 were married and living with their husbands. Another 20% were divorced, widowed, or separated. And only 28% had never been married. 20 years later, only 31% of black women in these age brackets were married and living with their husbands, while 48% had never married. By 1994, an absolute majority, 56%, of black women in these age brackets were never married, and only 25% were married and living with their husbands. Accordingly, while two-thirds of black children were living with both parents in 1960, only one-third were by 1994. While only 22% of black children were born to unmarried women in 1960, 70% were by 1994. White liberals, instead of comparing what has happened to the black family since the liberal welfare state policies of the 1960s were put into practice, compare black families to white families and conclude that the higher rates of broken homes and unwed motherhood among blacks are due to a legacy of slavery. But why the large-scale disintegration of the black family should have begun a hundred years after slavery is left unexplained. Whatever the situation of the black family relative to the white family, in the past or the present, it is clear that broken homes were far more common among blacks at the end of the 20th century than they were in the middle of that century or at the beginning of that century.
even though blacks at the beginning of the 20th century were just one generation out of slavery. The widespread and casual abandonment of their children and of the women who bore them by black fathers in the ghettos of the late 20th century was, in fact, a painfully ironic contrast with what had happened in the immediate aftermath of slavery a hundred years earlier, when observers in the South reported desperate efforts of freed blacks to find family members who had been separated from them during the era of slavery. A contemporary journalist reported meeting black men walking along the roads of Virginia and North Carolina, many of whom had walked across the state or across more than one state looking for their families. Others reported similar strenuous and even desperate efforts of newly freed blacks to find members of their families. It should be noted again that not all blacks today are part of the redneck culture. Far from it. Nor has that culture been the only culture in which blacks lived in the past. There were small but significant enclaves of New England culture introduced into southern black communities by teachers from New England who poured into the South immediately after the end of the Civil War to establish schools and to teach and acculturate the children of freed slaves. Often, these were the only schools available for black children because the South was slow to begin establishing public schools, especially for blacks. W.E.B. Du Bois called the work of these dedicated missionaries the finest thing in American history. By 1866, just one year after the Civil War ended, there were about 1,400 northern white teachers from dozens of religious missionary associations teaching black children in 975 southern schools the numbers suggesting that these were mostly the kinds of one-room schoolhouses common at the time in rural areas, which is where most southern blacks lived. Just a few years later, at the end of the decade, there were more than 2,500 northern teachers in just over 2,000 schools for black children. A sample of about 1,000 of these teachers whose origins could be traced showed that more than 500 came directly from New England and the others are believed to include people born in New England but who came south directly from some other location. To put this in perspective, only 17% of the northern population lived in New England at the time, so this was a wholly disproportionate representation of New Englanders among those who began to educate newly emancipated blacks. This was a New England-led crusade, much like the pre-war abolitionist movement, and many of those who went into the postbellum south were former abolitionists. These teachers brought a wholly different culture into the South. In the words of distinguished black scholar E. Franklin Frazier, the missionaries from New England who founded the first schools for Negroes in the South left the imprint of their Puritan background upon Negro education. In addition to strict morality, these missionaries taught the Yankee virtues of industry and thrift. This cultural transformation was not incidental, the avowed purpose of the American Missionary Association was to transplant a different culture into the school and college enclaves which they established among young blacks in the South in order to deliberately supplant the existing culture. These were deeply religious institutions, but in the New England sense, so that black students were not to indulge in the religious emotionalism of the black masses in the South. They were to be different in many other ways, as E. Franklin Frazier noted. First, students were taught to speak English correctly and thus avoid the ungrammatical speech and dialect of the Negro masses. They were expected to be courteous, speak softly, and never exhibit the spontaneous boisterousness of ordinary Negroes. The casual Southern attitude toward sex was not tolerated. To be detected in immoral sex behavior, especially if the guilty person was a woman, meant expulsion from the school. The American Missionary Association was quite explicit in their desire to remove black youngsters from their existing culture and place them in enclaves of the culture transplanted from the North. In an 1882 essay titled Change of Environment, Dr. W. W. Patton, president of the AMA, lamented that many black children grow up in communities of prevailing ignorance, superstition, and immorality, where they live in miserable hovels, see only examples of coarseness and rudeness, and hear only a Negro dialect, when what was needed was a total change of environment by removing young people to places where morals are pure, where manners are refined, where language is grammatical. <laughs>
Far from celebrating the existing culture of the black community, Dr. Patton declared, All improvement must be by an influence from without, which shall quicken and inspire, which shall teach and guide. This being the purpose of planting and strengthening the educational institutions which operate to change for the better the environment of the colored race in this country. Although there was another educational tradition established at the Hampton Institute in Virginia and transplanted to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama by Booker T. Washington, a graduate of Hampton, this tradition as well was based on replacing the existing culture of Southern blacks with a new imported culture. Hampton Institute's founder, General Samuel Chapman Armstrong, declared that the average Negro student needed a residential boarding school that could control the entire 24 hours of each day. Only thus can old ideas and ways be pushed out and new ones take their place. Addressing the American Missionary Association in 1877, the principal of Hampton Institute said, There is no lack of those who have mental capacity, the question with him is not one of brains, but of right instincts, of morals, and of hard work. Contrary to later caricatures, neither Hampton Institute nor Tuskegee Institute was based on an assumption that blacks had the capacity to be only hewers of wood and drawers of water. In short, however divergent the different schools of thought were on educational philosophy, as between the Hampton-Tuskegee approach and the approach of the founders of other institutions for blacks, they were agreed that what was most needed for the advancement of blacks in the post-bellum South was the replacement of the culture prevailing around them and among them by a new imported culture. However, the greatest obstacle to creating this new culture was the existing black redneck culture. For many missionaries, the physical problems of overwork, illness, and poor facilities were less frustrating than their everyday dealing with the freedmen. A constant problem for teachers was student absenteeism. A pupil would attend school for a few days, disappear for a time, then come back again. Multiplied by a factor of 40 or 50, this made classroom continuity difficult. This irregularity, said one teacher, was a positive vice of the freedmen. A related weakness was unreliability. You can never depend on anything promised when a typical complaint Another general failing among the colored people, according to many teachers, was their tardiness at meetings, classes, church services, and so on. More serious were sexual offenses, theft, and lying. Many of the teachers blamed such behavior on slavery, but, as we have already seen, similar behavior was common among white rednecks on both sides of the Atlantic, people who had never been enslaved. Remarkably, the Northern teachers persisted in the face of difficult students and a hostile white Southern society from which they were excluded and by which they were sometimes terrorized. Although many teachers burned out in a few years, new teachers continued to arrive from New England and other parts of the North, thousands in the post-war decades. When black colleges were founded, New Englanders were again disproportionately represented among their teachers and college presidents and much of these colleges' philosophy was that of New England. These institutions introduced strict behavioral standards, as well as high academic standards, imposing stern discipline and developing self-discipline in a region where such was not the norm for either blacks or whites. Noted black scholar and educator Charles S. Johnson said, No less stern rectitude could have broken the grip of habits adjusted to a now outmoded life of irresponsibility and reshape them to a new and serious purpose. W.E.B. Du Bois, himself a New Englander, and with the first Ph.D. from Harvard earned by a black man, declared the movement to plant the New England College in the South to be the salvation of the South and the Negro. Perhaps even more remarkable than these dedicated efforts was the fact that such efforts began to produce educational results early on. In 1871, the Georgia legislature created a board of visitors to attend public examinations at Atlanta University. The chairman of the first board of visitors was ex-slaveholder Joseph Brown, who reportedly said that he expected the examinations to confirm the Negro's inferiority. But the recitations of former slaves in Latin, Greek, and geometry forced from him the confession 
that we were impressed with the fallacy of the popular idea that the members of the African race are not capable of a high grade of intellectual culture. And the Atlanta Constitution could hardly believe what we witnessed to see colored boys and girls 14 to 18 years of age reading in Greek and Latin and demonstrating correctly problems in algebra and geometry appears almost wonderful. However discordant the philosophy of the American Missionary Association may have been with multicultural views prevailing today, the crucial fact is that it worked, as so many of today's notions do not. There was yet another route by which New England culture reached some blacks in the 19th century. Oberlin College was founded by New Englanders in 1833, and it functioned as a New England college transplanted to Ohio, an outpost of New England culture beyond the Appalachians, as one scholar put it. It was also one of the few colleges to which blacks were admitted before the Civil War, as well as being a station on the Underground Railroad through which Southern blacks escaped from slavery. Although blacks were no more than 5% of the students at Oberlin College, Oberlin was a much more significant factor in the higher education of blacks. Of the 309 blacks who were known to have received a degree from a white college in America up through 1899, nearly half, 149, received their degrees from Oberlin. The first black woman to receive a college degree in America received it in Oberlin's class of 1862. She became the principal of a remarkable high school for blacks in Washington, D.C., discussed in a later essay as Dunbar High School. Of that school's first ten principals, three were graduates of Oberlin, two graduated from Harvard, and one each from Amherst and Dartmouth. In essence, most of this highly successful school's principals during its early formative period had New England educations and a New England culture, whether or not they received that education in New England itself. A wholly disproportionate share of future black leaders came out of the schools and colleges established by New Englanders in the South, not even counting Oberlin College or Dunbar High School. These alumni of institutions founded as New England enclaves in the South included W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, Langston Hughes, Walter White, Mary McLeod Bethune, A. Philip Randolph, James Farmer, Thurgood Marshall, and Martin Luther King, Jr. In addition to these individuals from these Southern institutions, the first black man to graduate from Annapolis, the first black woman to earn a Ph.D., the first black general, the first black cabinet member, and the first black federal judge all came from the same public high school, Dunbar High School in Washington, with its culturally New England educated principals in its formative years. Such concentrations of black pioneers and leaders in a few highly atypical cultural enclaves suggests that their achievements were not solely a matter of individual ability, cream rising to the top, but were also a result of a culture very unlike that in which most blacks were raised and educated. However much the achievements of these individuals have been celebrated, the culture behind those achievements has not been. Today, the culture that is celebrated in much of the media and in the schools is not the culture that succeeded, but the culture that has failed, the black redneck culture. When white couples who adopt black children are warned to be sure to put those children in touch with their cultural heritage, all too often that means the black redneck culture. Internal cultural differences among blacks have long been extreme ranging from such things as urbanization, education, and regional distribution, to rates of crime, economic achievement, and general acculturation to the norms of the surrounding society. Historically, the most fundamental difference for many generations was between those blacks who were slaves and those who were free. They differed not only in their legal status, but also in their regional distribution, their degree of urbanization, and even biologically. There were free blacks as far back as the 17th century. In fact, there were free blacks before there were slaves in America. The first Africans brought in captivity to colonial Virginia in 1619 became indentured servants, like the white indentured servants who were common in colonial America. Only later, with the mass importation of Africans, did this change. The first law in America recognizing perpetual slavery appeared in 1661 in Virginia.
The small class of free blacks in colonial America had fewer restrictions than other free blacks would have in the 19th century, and many of them and their descendants made use of their opportunities. There was a black writer named Gustavus Vassa, whose book was popular enough to go through eight editions at a time when the vast majority of blacks were still illiterate slaves in the South. Benjamin Banneker was a publisher of almanacs and was also one of those who designed the layout of the city of Washington. Again, long before most blacks were either free or able to read and write. There were not just isolated individual blacks who were culturally more advanced than other blacks, but whole classes of blacks who had achieved cultural levels that most blacks would not achieve until many generations later. The size of the free black population increased after the United States came into existence as an independent nation, as the ideology of freedom associated with the American Revolution led most northern states to abolish slavery, and even in the South, enough white slave owners freed their slaves to cause the free black population there to nearly double and then redouble between 1790 and 1810. Both the regional distribution and the degree of urbanization of free and enslaved blacks differed greatly. After the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, the cotton plantations of the Deep South began to draw slaves away from Upper South states like Virginia and North Carolina, toward more southerly states like Mississippi and Alabama, sometimes as individuals sold down the river and often as part of whole plantations that relocated. Thus, the geographic center of the black population moved steadily southwestward at an average of about 50 miles per decade. Meanwhile, the free persons of color were moving in the directly opposite direction. While more than 90% of the antebellum black population lived in the South, the free persons of color were evenly divided between the states of the North and South, and within the South, they tended to leave the Deep South and gravitate toward that region's less oppressive places farther north. The difference in geographic distribution was so extreme that in 1860 there were more free blacks living in the city of Washington alone than in the states of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia combined, these states having huge concentrations of slaves. The slave and the free also differed greatly in urbanization. While most black slaves worked in rural settings, by 1860 the free persons of color were more urbanized than even the white population. There were cultural consequences to these historic and geographic differences. While the vast majority of slaves could neither read nor write, the census of 1850 showed that most free persons of color were literate. But it would be half a century later, two generations after emancipation, before the same would be true of the black population as a whole. It would be 1940 before the black population as a whole became as urbanized as the free persons of color were in 1850. The cultural head starts of this segment of the black population had enduring consequences. The descendants of the antebellum free persons of color remained predominant among black leaders in many fields, well into the 20th century, and they included W.E.B. Du Bois, Thomas Fortune, Charles Waddell Chestnut, Thurgood Marshall, John Hope Franklin, and many others. Most black holders of doctoral degrees in the middle of the 20th century, as well as most Negroes working in the professions in the nation's capital at that time, were by all indications descendants of the antebellum free persons of color, a group that was never more than 14% of the black population. As a group, the free persons of color also differed from the slaves in racial mixture. As in most of the Western Hemisphere, freed slaves were often the offspring of those who freed them and the adults freed were more often female than male. While only 8% of slaves met the stringent U.S. Census requirement of half or more white ancestry to be classified as mulatto, 37% of the free persons of color did. This is not to say that all the others in either category were of pure African ancestry, but there were very noticeable skin color differences between the more acculturated descendants of those freed before the Civil War and those freed as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation. The noticeably greater success of the former was often attributed to their white ancestry, both by whites and by some of the Negro elite themselves. But the historical and cultural antecedents of that success are undeniable. Moreover, the later rise of other blacks to similar levels of achievement undermines the biological explanation of these internal differences among blacks.
The point here is that cultural differences led to striking socioeconomic differences among blacks, as they did among whites. In both races, those who lived within the redneck culture lagged far behind those who did not. That these cultural differences among blacks also coincided with biological differences did not mean that biology explained the differences in performance. The offspring of white slave owners not only had a better chance of being freed, they also tended to have better opportunities while still enslaved, being more likely to be house servants rather than field hands, and, in some cases, living the lives of de facto free persons while still legally in bondage. Reconstruction-era black senator Blanche K. Bruce, for example, was, during the era of slavery, tutored alongside his owner's son, or other son, as many believed. During the antebellum era, there were other mulatto offspring of white slave owners who were given special consideration and aid. Some were sent to Oberlin College, sometimes with an intermediary handling financial arrangements, apparently to conceal the identity of the white father. This is not to say that most slave owners freed their mulatto offspring, but that, of those blacks freed voluntarily, mulattoes were far more common than among the slave population in general and that women were freed more often than men. Moreover, this pattern prevailed throughout the Western Hemisphere. The point here is that the descendants of free persons of color had a cultural history that served them better than the cultural history of the descendants of slaves, even after the abolition of slavery ended differences in their legal status. Whether by individual escapes from slavery, by voluntary manumissions in the antebellum South, or by general emancipation by law in the northern states. A black class of free persons of color emerged long before the Emancipation Proclamation. The more prosperous of these families were able to educate their own children, sometimes through college, and these were typically lighter-skinned people, as well as people with generations of a head start in freedom and acculturation, as compared to the mass of enslaved blacks. The net result was that the elite among American Negroes tended to be, and to remain for generations after emancipation, a racially mixed group that married among themselves and formed a socially exclusive class. Among 19th century Negroes in Philadelphia, for example, 85% of mulatto men married mulatto women, and 93% of black men married black women. This was not solely a matter of color prejudice, for there were major behavioral differences between the two groups. The mulatto neighborhoods had lower crime rates and a higher percentage of their children attending school, as compared to the black neighborhoods, even though it can hardly be claimed that school attendance or crime rates are genetically predetermined. In short, there were major cultural differences. And these differences in turn produced other differences, such as a higher occupational status, better housing, and more wealth among the mulattoes. Nor was this pattern confined to Philadelphia. All across the country, north and south, the elite of the Negro community were lighter in complexion than the masses, and very self-conscious and sometimes snobbish about that fact. This remained so through at least the first half of the 20th century. Among the consequences of the extreme range of education and acculturation within the Negro community has been the larger society's erection of racial barriers provoked by black rednecks, which barriers then deeply offended those individuals at the other end of the cultural spectrum. These barriers, based on race, prevented cultural elites from separating themselves as much as they would like from lower-class blacks, with whom they were forced to live in proximity and to share institutions. Yet, protests against racial barriers had to be made in the name of all, light or dark, leading to charges of hypocrisy against the elites who spearheaded protests against white social and economic barriers, while maintaining their own social and economic barriers against the black lower class. That internal social barriers within the black community became more pronounced at the same time as white barriers against blacks in general suggests that more than coincidence was involved, since both occurred in the wake of the mass arrival of black rednecks from the South. Among the behavioral differences between the black elites and the black masses was that the elites had more stable families, with separation or divorce being rare among them. It took more than money or a light complexion to enter the social circles of the black elite. Behavioral standards were also essential,
and individuals who met these standards could be admitted with little money and regardless of complexion, though the history of black rednecks meant that few would rise to elite levels. Cultural differences affected not only the internal development of the black community, but also the way that the black community as a whole was treated by the larger surrounding white community, and the way in which that treatment varied over time. The small number of blacks who were free in colonial times were joined over the generations by increasing numbers of blacks who were either released from bondage or who escaped on their own. The growth of this largely unacculturated population, fugitives in the rough, in the words of black historian Carter G. Woodson, in northern cities during the first half of the 19th century, brought both social barriers and discriminatory laws barring black children from schools and black adults from equal access to public accommodations. Yet, as these black communities grew more acculturated over time and began to rise economically, these laws and practices began to be relaxed in many northern cities in the latter part of the 19th century. Writing in 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois noted a growing liberal spirit toward the Negro in Philadelphia, in which the community was disposed to throw off the trammels, brush away petty hindrances, and to soften the harshness of race prejudice, leading, among other things, to blacks being able to live in white neighborhoods. Jacob Rees noted similar changes in New York, and similar trends emerged in other northern cities in the last quarter of the 19th century. In Detroit, blacks who had been denied the vote in 1850 were voting in the 1880s, and in the 1890s, blacks were being elected to public office by a predominantly white electorate in Michigan. The black upper class in Detroit at that time had regular social interactions with whites, and their children attended high schools and colleges with whites. In Illinois, during the same era, legal restrictions on access to public accommodations for blacks were removed from the law even though there were not enough black voters at the time to influence public policy, so that this represented changes in white public opinion. By all indications, northern black urban communities were themselves becoming cleaner, safer, and more orderly during this era of improving race relations, so changes in white public opinion were not merely inexplicable mood swings, Neither were the later retrogressions in race relations in the North, which followed a massive influx of black migrants from the South, black rednecks, at the beginning of the 20th century. As late as 1890, nine-tenths of all blacks in the United States still lived in the South, but those who lived in northern urban communities were largely from families long settled there. Most blacks living in New York State, for example, were born in New York State. In short, there were settled communities in both regions, and by all indications, the northern black communities at that time were acculturating to the norms of the northern white society around them. But all of that changed radically within a relatively few years, as massive migrations from the south not only enlarged northern black communities, but transformed them culturally. In 1900, for the first time, more than half of all blacks living in New York state had been born outside that state. Newcomers from the South became growing majorities in northern urban black communities in other states as well. The record-breaking migrations of blacks from the South to the North during the first decade of the 20th century was nearly tripled during the second decade, and that in turn was almost doubled again during the decade of the 1920s. Moreover, the proportion of these migrants coming from the Deep South, as distinguished from the Upper South, increased over time which meant that the least educated and least acculturated became a growing proportion of the black migrant population moving into the northern cities. There were about 30,000 blacks living in Chicago in 1900, but this grew to well over 100,000 by 1920 and more than 277,000 by 1940. In Detroit, the black population grew from a little more than 4,000 in 1900 to more than 40,000 in 1920 and over 149,000 by 1940. New York City's black population was a little more than 60,000 in 1900, but grew to more than 150,000 by 1920 and more than 450,000 by 1940. Riding in the midst of these massive migrations, historian Carter G. Woodson predicted, the maltreatment of the Negro will be nationalized by this exodus. That is what had happened a hundred years earlier, and now it happened again.
The sheer numbers of these new black migrants from the South not only overwhelmed the relatively small black populations in northern cities demographically in the early 20th century. Their very different behavior patterns shocked both blacks and whites at the time, as witnessed by adverse comments from earlier black settlers and the black press, denouncing the new arrivals from the South as vulgar, rowdy, unwashed, and criminal. Nor were these conclusions without foundation. For example, a study in early 20th century Pennsylvania found that the rate of violent crimes by blacks who had migrated there was nearly five times the rate of such crimes by blacks born in Pennsylvania. In Washington, the rate of births out of wedlock more than doubled with a large influx of southern blacks during the late 19th century. One indication of the white reaction was that blacks no longer remained as free to live in white neighborhoods. This represented a major retrogression in race relations. In the late 19th century, racial segregation in housing in northern cities was no longer what it had once been, or what it would become again in the years ahead. In Detroit, as early as 1860, no neighborhood was even 50% black. In Chicago, as late as 1910, more than two-thirds of the black population lived in neighborhoods where most residents were white. But after the mass migrations of blacks from the South, attempts by blacks to move into white neighborhoods in Chicago were met with violence, including bombings. New York, Philadelphia, and Washington were also cities which began to restrict blacks to ghettos only after the massive influx of Southern blacks and their redneck culture. In many cities, blacks were prevented from moving into existing white neighborhoods, but in other cases, whites simply moved out when blacks moved in. Harlem, the first of the great northern black ghettos, was still predominantly white as late as 1910. Racial segregation in housing became an explicit law in Baltimore in 1911. In one way or another, residential segregation became the norm in northern cities. Residential segregation was not the only retrogression in race relations during this period. In some northern and midwestern cities where schools had been racially integrated for years, black children were now segregated from white children after the mass influx of blacks from the South. Blacks in Washington were no longer allowed in white theaters, restaurants, or hotels, and their opportunities to work in white-collar occupations shrank. W.E.B. Du Bois summarized these retrogressions this way. Yet it has everywhere been manifest in the long run that while a part of the Negroes were native-born and trained in the culture of the city, the others were immigrants largely ignorant and unused to city life. There were, of course, manifold exceptions, but this was the rule. Thus the history of the Negro in northern cities is the history of the rise of a small group by accretion from without but at the same time periodically overwhelmed by them and compelled to start over again when once the material had been assimilated. In Philadelphia, for example, the native-born blacks had advanced, but, according to Du Bois, they were overwhelmed and dragged back by black migrants from the South. He added, In New York, the native-born have been perhaps even more completely overwhelmed. This pattern is confirmed in places where the retrogression in race relations took place at a different time because of local differences in the timing of large-scale in-migration of blacks from the South. In San Francisco, for example, that mass influx took place during the Second World War as blacks from the South were attracted by jobs in new war production facilities, notably the Kaiser shipyards. Henry Kaiser recruited Southern blacks and brought them to the San Francisco Bay Area by the trainloads. The black population of San Francisco, which had been less than 5,000 in 1940, rose to more than 40,000 by the time of the 1950 census, and the black populations of Oakland and Berkeley also rose several fold during the same decade. In the San Francisco Bay Area, as in the northern cities half a century earlier, there was a long settled black population which lived free of the Jim Crow laws and practices of the South and which had been able to get civil service jobs as far back as the 1920s. But although the newcomers were skilled workers more often than the local black residents, culturally, the newcomers lagged far behind. Native-born blacks in the Bay Area described the newcomers as foreign in the way they talked and in their behavior. For example, eating hamburgers openly on the bus, and bologna, and loud talking and fighting on the buses. That never happened in the old days.
some of the new blacks from the South were described as having a little more of a chip on their shoulder than the people out here did. Many local blacks thought that white racism increased after World War II, when both Southern blacks and Southern whites began arriving in large numbers. A similar retrogression in race relations on the Pacific coast during the Second World War occurred in Portland, Oregon, where again there were large influxes of black workers to take jobs in the growing war industries. These new black arrivals with little education were resented by the small group of law-abiding and self-sustaining Negroes already living in Portland. As in other places and times, a ghetto now developed in Portland, and discriminations in regard to civil rights were instituted. On the national scene, the much later receding of racism and the socioeconomic advancement of blacks in the second half of the 20th century cannot be attributed simply to the passage of time, for the passage of time had produced major retrogressions in race relations before. Nor can these advances be attributed to the civil rights laws that began in the 1960s, for the advancement of blacks antedated any serious civil rights legislation by years and was in fact more dramatic in the years preceding such legislation. Between 1940 and 1960, the percent of black families with incomes below the official poverty line fell from 87% to 47%. In various skilled trades, the income of blacks relative to whites more than doubled between 1936 and 1959. The principal factor that raised black incomes during that period, both absolutely and relative to white income, was migration, from low-income areas to higher-income areas. However much these migrations set back those blacks who were already living in northern cities, this movement from the South put millions of blacks into places where their children would get better education, while their parents had better job opportunities. With the passing years and generations, more and more of these migrant families ceased to be black rednecks, acculturating themselves in new surroundings, as minority groups tend to do in countries around the world. Once again, racial barriers began to erode after World War II and before the civil rights legislation of the 1960s. Perhaps the most dramatic example was the crumbling of racial barriers in professional sports exemplified by Jackie Robinson's becoming the first black Major League Baseball player in 1947, 17 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A poll that year showed his popularity to be second only to longtime entertainment idol Bing Crosby. The process of ending racial segregation in American military services was also begun during the Truman administration, years before segregation was declared unlawful in civilian life. In 1948, President Harry Truman ran for re-election on a platform that included civil rights for blacks, which some thought would doom his candidacy. But the fact that he won suggests that white public opinion had already begun to change. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 dealt major blows to racial restrictions, especially in the South, and had dramatic effects on the number of black elected officials. Economically, however, the upward trends in black income and occupations that had begun decades earlier simply continued, but at no accelerated rate. The rise of blacks into professional and other high-level occupations was in fact greater in the years preceding the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than in the years afterward, and was greater in the 1940s than in the 1950s. Behind such developments was the fact that blacks were closing the gap between themselves and whites in years of schooling during this era. In short, major social transformations within the black community were having an impact in their economic condition. It would hardly be surprising if it also had an impact on how whites viewed blacks, as had happened in the 19th century. The civil rights legislation of the 1960s may well have been an effect of the rise of blacks, rather than the sole or predominant cause of that rise, as it has been represented as being, by those leaders, black and white, with incentives to magnify their own role in racial progress. The difference between cultural explanations of changing race relations and explanations based on political acts or swings of the pendulum in white public opinion is not just a matter of intellectual preference. There are wholly different implications, not only about the past, but especially about the future.
The question is whether the advancement of blacks is helped or hindered by promoting a black identity built around a redneck culture whose track record has been largely negative for both blacks and whites.